Sweet School on RealArtCulture.com is brought to you by Syngenta Canada, Alberta Wheat Commission, and CNM Seeds. Kelvin Hepner with uh, Real Agriculture at the University of Manitoba and uh, joined by Amy Mongin from uh, the Department of Soil Sciences. And Amy, you've been doing research looking at, uh, at nitrogen applications on wheat and we have these new wheat varieties that have been grown in the last number of years here in Western Canada that have higher yield potentials. So nitrogen recommendations need, uh, need updating. Can you, I guess, first of all, before we get into what you've found from your research in the last few years, take us through what you've been looking at and some of the comparisons looking at timing of nitrogen application on wheat. Yeah, so we're looking at just the simple question of what rate is going to be most efficient to hit these yield and protein goals for these varieties. So just increasing rates in 30 pounds per acre intervals. And then we're also looking at um, split application timing. So we're looking at putting a base rate down in the spring and then topping up either at stem elongation or flag leaf timing. And that to top up to a level of what we would consider an optimum level. And then as well, we're also looking at a split between uh, base rate in the spring and then a post anthesis application, which is mostly for protein bump. But So we have three different in-season timings that we're looking at. We're also looking at um, a couple different sources. So ESN blends applied in the spring versus conventional urea. And then also two different sources for post anthesis timing. So we're looking at UAN as well as a dissolved urea solution. And those are both applied uh, just at 30 pounds per acre on top of a base rate at post anthesis. Mm -hmm. And all that early end, that's, that's the end that goes towards yield. It's the, the late stuff there. You're not impacting yield when you're applying that, right? Yeah. So we were kind of hoping to see throughout the different stages. So between the stem elongation, flag leaf and post anthesis, where are, when we applied it, where it was kind of the cutoff of this nitrogen is going towards yield and to, and which the later in the season you go, when it starts going towards protein and it doesn't necessarily have enough time to be contributed into yield and have a return in grain yield, but might necessarily help you get or bump up your protein. Mm -hmm. Did you find at what point the plant kind of switches from putting that nitrogen into, into yield versus, versus protein in the, in the grain? We saw that um, our flag leaf applications, we actually were still seeing very similar yields um, when, as to when it was applied entirely in spring. But we did see that with the post anthesis application, uh, your yield potential, you need to have applied enough nitrogen to meet yield potential before you apply that post anthesis because the post anthesis application is not necessarily going to affect your yield at all. It's definitely an application that should be designed for a protein increase more than anything. Okay. So when, when growers look at, your, at the results from your study, what do you think they will uh, notice and, and will be something that, that they could change in terms of their practices? Is there a certain thing that is, is obvious? Hey, we need to uh, look at either bumping up nitrogen rates in spring or, uh, or I, I know there's more and more interest in split application of, of N and I guess your research verifies that that works for boosting protein. Yeah, so we saw across all site years we did see that our split applications were working quite well. We were seeing good yields with the split application compared to the traditional practice of applying it all in the spring. We can't necessarily expect that every year consistently across site years because obviously your environmental conditions are a huge influencing factor of that. But the one thing we did notice that was important was that with our high yields, especially in 2017, was that even when I was applying up to 200 pounds of acre that I wasn't necessarily applying enough nitrogen to hit those high yield goals as well as the high protein goals. So our protein was falling short when we had sites that were yielding over 100 bushels per acre, even when, even with the really high applied nitrogen, which is typically higher than what a lot of guys are applying mm -hmm. or used to applying. Did you find any terms, any, any points where you're seeing diminishing returns though, like a kind of a critical spot where okay, that's enough nitrogen to, to maximize yield, or, or I guess protein would be the more, the better example in that case where really you're aiming for 13.5% protein. Like in terms of economics? Yeah, in ter yeah, or even, yeah, maybe that's getting into more of the pricing of nitrogen, yeah. and that's maybe a factor that you didn't... 
We will. Yeah. We are planning on doing economic analysis on this. We just haven't quite got that far yet. So we are planning on hopefully um, running regression analysis with some of this yield data as well as incorporating the protein premiums in there because we, d we did this trial on uh, two different varieties. So a variety that typically has higher protein, so Brandon and as well as a uh, Canadian Northern Hard Red, so Prosper, that has high yields and lower protein. So, and we didn't see an interaction with protein, so we saw that both varieties responded similar to nitrogen in terms of protein um, for a biological response. But when you look at it in economic response, you will see that because Brandon is going to hit a protein premium before Prosper, um, economically you will have an interaction with um, nitrogen in the varieties. So that's kind of where we're heading now with our analysis. We just haven't quite got there yet. Okay. So overall, nitrogen recommendations for wheat, I think it sounds like are going to be not, not more complicated, but more precise. It's not just going to be put down this many pounds per acre if this is what your yield target is. It's going to depend on what you're aiming for, variety, characteristics, m all these different variables that have shown in, in your in your research? Yeah, there's definitely a lot more to take into consideration. A different Another part of this project that I didn't uh, touch on today, but we are looking at um, tests for estimating mineralization because we saw that there's huge site-to-site -site differences in terms of yield potential and response to protein, or response to nitrogen in general. And that has uh, a lot to do with mineralization at different sites. So we were hoping to find a couple different tests that might be useful for m estimating the soil's potential at a certain site to release nitrogen throughout the growing season. Unfortunately, we weren't successful with that, but it just shows that there is such an importance that needs to be emphasized on a site-to-site -site difference and environmental factors that need to be taken into consideration um, rather than just looking at, I want an 80 bushel an acre crop, how much nitrogen mm -hmm. do I need to put down? as well as timings, if it's a dry year versus wet year, um, are you going to have enough moisture to incorporate that nitrogen that you're putting down at flag leaf, if not? So there's definitely a lot more to take into consideration than just your spring applied nitrogen rates. Yeah. So finally then, Amy, what's the, the next step uh, in terms of conveying this information to producers, or how do you see it being put into, into practice in terms of wheat production in, on the prairies? So we are working, um, the wheat and barley growers of Manitoba are the f primary funders of this project. So this project has is done now. It ran for 2016-2017 field seasons. So we do have a final report for this project that will be coming out in the new year, so probably around February. And it'll have a full report of everything done. Because we, we had a lot more site years than just the Carmen and Brunkild, which I presented um, today. So we have sites in that southeast or southwest corner, so out in Melita, out in Carberry, we do have interlake sites to just kind of tie it together as a whole provincial summary. So that report will be available online to anyone that's interested. And then we are hopefully at Ag Days and Crop Connect presenting a more full story of this data. And then um, we have follow up projects that will be expanding on kind of where this project ended that will be coming up in the 2018-2019 okay. growing seasons. Yeah. So do we see new nitrogen recommendations or updated nitrogen recommendations? Because where do they go till right now? Is it six? What, what is, what's the max target yield on the current recommendation? Yeah, so the current curve is based off of lower yielding varieties yeah. and the high highest yielding variety was I think 55, 60 bushels yeah. an acre. So we are hoping to get, we are working with AgVise in this project. So hoping to update our nitrogen recommendations in terms of what's coming back on your egg vi soil test. But in terms of what that might look like, we're not quite sure yet because we're trying to run our regressions right now on this yield data. But that is kind of the end goal of this project is to have an updated set of recommendations to help producers and agronomists in the field. Yeah. Is there a timeline for, for that? Well, <laughs> that's tough. Like, hopefully after we have the final report out like this coming spring we might be able to be extension um providing it but we might not have it in terms of an official recommendation yeah. so in the next couple of years though. yeah i was going to say within the next couple of years because the new project will also build on it too so yeah cool well thanks for the update amy and we'll yep. definitely follow where it goes thanks, thanks.